organizational um, work that they went through to, to bring this, um, bring me here. Um, and I, I hope I get to find out what all of those centers do at some point, because um, they sound like, sounds like you're all doing interesting and good work here. Um, and as Janet said, my talk today is about my book, God Needs No Passport, which is about four immigrant communities in the Boston metropolitan area and how they um, simultaneously become part of the United States, but also stay connected to their homelands, and how they use religion to do that. Um, and it's a book that's really very self-consciously uh, a book of public sociology. So I like to say that there's a book in the footnotes and there's a book in the text, um, because I really wanted to um, engage with theoretical issues, but also try to bring some of what we talk about in the academy to um, a broader public. So I want to try to give you a sense of both of those parts of the book today in my talk and um, talk about how the everyday lived experience of globalizing religion actually gets done and then what I think that that means for how we need to think about the nation and um, religion and immigration. Now I'm actually going to start by showing you some slides that are from the Dominican Republic these are, this is not a talk about the Dominican Republic, but these are the best kind of pictures that I have for those of you in the room 
um, who aren't migration scholars and don't think about this 24 hours a day to capture the kind of dynamics that I'm, I'm trying to get across. So bear with me, please, and, and um, uh, let's see. This doesn't seem to want to work now. Let's see. What do you think? Ah, there we go. OK. So these are pictures from uh, the village of Miraflores, where I did my field work for the book, The Transnational Villagers. And this is a small community of about 4,000 um, residents. And uh, in the, the last time I counted, which was in the mid-1990s, about 75% of the households had relatives living in the greater Boston metropolitan area. So there's a big connection between this community. And this is what the houses looked like before immigration became so prominent. So wood with a zinc roof and that wire that you see running across the, state, uh, the screen is the electricity being pirated. But these are what some of the houses look like now. Not all, but some of the houses, uh, there's a, been a lot of money made in the United States. And so people are, have built these much bigger houses that not only have you know, running water and electricity and air conditioning and windows for the first time, but also really changed the nature of the social dynamic because in, that, in front of the first house, after the day's work was done, people would you know, take their rocking chair out, uh, sit outside, people would pass back and forth. Um, now all of that kind of socializing takes place behind that, um, behind that gate. And so things have really, um, the social dynamics have really been transformed. This is what the countryside looks like outside of the village. And so it's an, an agricultural economy. The principal plants are, uh, the principal crops are um, avocados and mangoes and small onions called ceboides. <laughs> But this, this place is also very much getting urbanized now. And so this, there were, when I first started traveling here about 20 years ago, there were no sidewalks and no paved roads. And now you see this is the last part of the village that's being, um, the, the, the roads are being paved. And this is partially being done because um, the, the community has a, um, a hometown association, what's been called a hometown association, where uh, money is raised in, in Boston and projects are implemented in the Dominican Republic. And once the government sees that the, the community is starting to solve its problems by itself, it starts to p step in and, and do the rest of the work so that the community uh, isn't so independent. And so that's a little of what's happening here. And here are some of the examples of the projects that have been done. So this is uh, an aqueduct which gives water for the first time, and a, a secure and reliable water source a funeral home that was built, uh, the baseball stadium, which if you know anything about the Dominican Republic is a very important part of community life, and a bench in the um, park. And if you look closely, that is, I call this community Miraflores in my, my book, but the name of it is Boca Canasta. And this is a bench that was donated by the committee in Boca Canasta and the members in Boston. So all of the the benches in the park have these names of the, of the donors uh, inscribed, and this one was donated by the committee. And then this is um, an ad that's painted on the back of the backdrop for the baseball stadium. So business owners buy space on this backdrop and, um, and advertise their businesses. But if you look closely, this is a business in Boston. It's in Jamaica Plain, where most of these people have settled. And that Freddy's Market is also a um, a business that's in Jamaica Plain. So this kind of shows you the interconnection between how this community, though separated by physical space, still occupies the same social and emotional and in some ways economic space. And the way that communities do this is sometimes through religion. And that was the, so that was how I moved from the transnational villagers to God Needs No Passport. And I think we see evidence of um, religions increasing diversity in the United States on every corner. So in New England, you have these archetypical, you know, white, uh, large steepled churches. And if you look closely, there's a sign in Korean or Chinese that says that there's an ethnic congregation that's being hosted there. Or in between the Dunkin' Donuts and the subway at the strip mall, there's a little um, uh, Hindu meeting. Uh, community or uh, an incipient mosque. And when the White House 
host celebrations of Eid and Diwali. It's really sending a message to us that the American religious rainbow has added more colors. And there are lots of commentators like Diana Eck and Martin Marty and Alan Wolf who celebrate this um, enhanced diversity. But nevertheless, they seem to attribute it to things that are happening inside US borders. So we have founding documents, the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights that ensured religious pluralism. And you know, during the civil rights movement, during the women's rights movement of the 1960s, this kind of culture of pluralism moves over into the mainstream. But I think we really need to broaden our, our lens and see religious pluralism in the United States as an integral piece of of a more global religious puzzle. So just as any CEO would probably lose their job if they didn't um, understand that their small company is affected by the global economy, so we miss the boat by continuing to insist that religion and culture are nationally bounded. And just as we understand that that company is part of a network of of a, of a global economic network of production and consumption and distribution. So religious uh, communities, that, that mosque in the strip mall or the Hindu meeting group that's, that's located there is also part, often part of a thick and dense and very uh, widespread network of, of where religious goods are produced and consumed. Now, religion and, and immigration inspire very passionate debates among Americans and among social scientists. But I want to suggest to you that a lot of these debates are out of sync with our national reality. So for one thing, a lot of people think that immigrants cut off their ties with their countries of origin, or if they don't, that they should. And, that, and, but, and because you see that more and more people even though they continue to vote and pray and invest in their homelands, they're also buying homes and starting businesses and joining the PTA in the United States. And what's more, they use religion often to do that. And most Americans, when we talk about religion, tend to conflate religion with a Christian uh, lens. And, and that blinds us to faiths. Um, Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist manifestations. Now, immigration also inspires debates among social scientists. Even though this has been changing in the, in the past years and some of this important work has been done here on this campus, there hasn't been that much work on religion among migration scholars, both because the world is supposed to become more secular and also because many social scientists are secular themselves. And social scientists are still divided over the usefulness of using a transnational lens. So we might compare immigration in Europe to immigration in the United States, but we don't often you know, tease out what those networks look like. Um, and we, we acknowledge that religion is global, but we don't do the work of unpacking how that religious globalization gets done. So in my talk today, I want to give you a sense of that by looking at how religious identities change, how religious architectures change, how religious practices change, and how the relationship between religion and politics change in the four communities that I studied. And then what that means for how we think about um, religion and immigration and the nation. So let me just say a little bit about my methodology. When I give this talk and people figure out how many um, interviews it's based on, they say, how did you do so many interviews? And then I say, well, why did it take me 10 years to do this study? So it's based on four, uh, 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 a study of four immigrant communities living in Boston. So it's Muslims from Pakistan, Hindus from Gujarat State, Irish Catholics from the Inish Owen Peninsula in County Donegal, and Brazilian Protestants from Governador Valadares in the state of Minas Gerais. And so these are all groups that have concentrations in the Boston metropolitan area. Except for the Pakistani, they're, they're not residentially concentrated. But the other groups, you can kind of point to particular neighborhoods where the people at least originally settled. And I did interviews with people in Boston. And then we went to, to each of the sending countries and did relatives with their, did interviews with their friends and family members. So in each case, I was trying to map the family ties, but also map the 
do interviews with religious leaders in both places and political leaders in both places to kind of map out the religious and political architecture. And I did this with a team of undergraduate and graduate student researchers and also very much um, very grateful to the four colleagues that worked with me in each sending country and taught, with, taught me a lot about what I know um, of, about each place. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about who it was that I interviewed. There were slightly more males than females in the, um, in the sample. More than half were between the ages of 20 and 39. More than two-thirds were married, and of those who had children, about 60% of those children were born in the United States. 44% were citizens, 28% were resident aliens, 11% said they were undocumented, and about 9% said they were dual citizens. And the next couple slides talk about simultaneous engagement. What did people say about their transnational practices? So 81% had visited their homelands, 55% contribute to charity in the US and in their homeland, and 54% send remittances at least occasionally. 50% read newspapers, watch movies, and TV from both countries. 80% phone home on a regular basis, and about 40% email at least occasionally. And then this next slide is about people's transnational plans. So what they anticipate they're gonna do in the future. So you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt. But the overwhelming majority say that they wanna to continue to visit. 48% want to invest in both places, and 26% said they want to work in both places. So in general, just the very broad brushstroke patterns. Most, more in Indian and Pakistani people came for education. <coughs> Brazilians were more likely to come for economic reasons. And the Irish came, don't forget that most of these people were leaving at the time of the height of the Celtic tiger. So they kind of came because Migration, emigration is a, a habit that's hard to break, and so there's a kind of um, a sense of needing to go out as a rite of passage of, of a kind of adventure that you have, and then maybe you stay abroad or maybe you come back. There was less transnational activism among the Brazilians, where it was confined mostly to, to religious activities, and among the Irish, and in general for all of the groups, there was more participation around sending remittances, charitable contributions and social or participating in social organizations and less around politics whether it was US politics or homeland politics and investment and work. Okay. So living all of these people are I hope I've convinced you by now are living in a transnational social field and that incorporates migrants and non-migrants. And so now I want to talk about how that changed their religious practices and the religious architecture in which they do those practices, those, they enact those practices. So the first thing I wanted to talk to people about was how do they identify and you know, who are you? And I would get answers uh, that weren't surprising, like people who claim to be American or people who claim to be Pakistani, so a national kind of identity, a cosmopolitan identity that was either rooted or sort of um, not you know, sort of feeling at home everywhere, an ethnic identity or a religious hyphenated identity. So I'm either a, an Indian American or a Hindu American. And, and an, a, third, a, a final one, which was religious global citizens. So religious global citizens are people who imagine themselves in a sacred, um, imagined religious landscape that's not divided up by the, if you think of an atlas and those little green and yellow pastel colored countries that make up each continent, the, the, the boundaries of this kind of sacred space are religious sites, pilgrimage sites, holy places, and, and this is where religious global citizens locate themselves. Now sometimes the, the religious imagined geography fits nicely within the political geography. Sometimes it kind of complements it, and sometimes it supersedes it. But for this group, the rules of religious citizenship are the ones that matter most. And I, I specifically chose to use the word citizenship, even though I knew that political scientists would take issue with me. Because when people talked about it, they used the logic that mimicked the logic of political citizenship. So people talked about rights and they talked about responsibilities, that there were benefits and there were obligations. And people 
um, interpreted this differently. So there was a small group who I would call exclusive religious global citizens. So they heard this uh, religious citizenship call as a call to take care of only their own. And then there were inclusive religious global citizens who entered the community of humankind through a religious door, but heard it as a call to be almost religious cosmopolitans. So let me give you an example of Eliana, who's a 34-year-old Brazilian former Catholic who joined an evangelical Christian church when she came to the United States. And she's a religious global citizen. Being Christian, she said, means a lot to her. It means being more separate from the world than she was before and isolating herself from people who don't live, in a, Christ who don't live a Christian life. I used to go to parties and be around people who were drinking. Life changes a lot when you decide to just leave that one side and to follow the word of Christ. I made difficult choices. Back then, the transition to get out from one world to come to another, it was as hard as it was for me when I left Brazil and came to the United States. To come to the United States from Brazil, leave everybody and everything behind, a whole life. I left a whole life behind me, and I didn't even look back. Because if you look, you can go back someday, right? I never looked back. And I feel the same thing when I talk about the fact that I'm an evangelical Christian. I left one world to go to another. So she basically has migrated twice. She migrated once from Brazil to the United States, and then from a secular space to a religious space. And her experience illustrates how people move between physical territories and real and imagined territories, and they use religion to make that journey, and also how that enables them to journey between the past and the present and at times as well. And this is, a, this is a religious territory that has the same attributes as political territories. So she talks about, later on, she goes on to talk about rights and responsibilities. So you pay your dues, you tithe, you obey the rules, you follow the, you obey the leader, and you get representation and protection in return. So it's a kind of the same kind of, it's a religious contract instead of a political contract. Okay, now migration and these kind of new religious identities that arise produce new religious architectures but are also enabled by religious architecture. So think about the most archetypical transnational uh, religious church, which is the Catholic Church, which is what I would call a, a transnational religious corporation. So it's got its CEO in the Vatican, um, the headquarters is in the Vatican, and when the Irish in my study or the Brazilians in my study move to other areas, they're thickening and deepening and spreading out what was already a well-established, widespread um, religious institution. Well, you also see um, similar kinds of religious networks forming to produce religious goods. So think of an example uh, is um, the uh, Brazilian Baptists, who were a very, very traditional conservative Brazilian denomination that came to the Boston area, who formed a covenant with the American Baptists, which is the New England version of the Southern Baptists, who are very progressive, who are very liberal, but who form this covenant with these people because it's, they want to be inclusive and because they have a very um, non-hierarchical decision-making structure, so they could decide to do that on their own. And so this was a kind of flexibly specialized um, network that formed that you know, might not last, that isn't very uh, systematic, but really worked for these two uh, particular communities. Now, within these transnational architectures, ideas and spirits and symbols and uh, religious uh, accoutrements, material objects, are circulating all the time. And so that leads to changes in religious practices. So I have, I've written elsewhere about the idea of social remittances, the idea that, that ideas and practices are also sent back to home communities. And so here I, I want to give you the example of the, the role of women in the Pakistani community. So the Pakistani community in Boston is a very well-off, educated community. Most of the people who first came are uh, came to go to graduate school at MIT or at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell to study engineering. So lots of professionals, lots of people in finance and in high tech. And they formed their own mosque because they felt that the other mosques in the area were too conservative. Now women 
pray alongside men in that mosque. They also play an important role in running the, the educational programs and the adult education programs and also all of the cultural events that take place at the mosque. And this kind of, the fact that they're playing this role and women participate in this way gets talked about back in Pakistan. And Pakistan is a place where women don't normally go to the mosque. And so um, when I went to Pakistan, I asked women about, had they heard about what was going on in Boston? Had they heard that their mothers and sisters were doing this? And, and they had. Most of them had. And some of them were not interested in all in doing that. But some of them were very interested in doing that and realized that you know, they weren't going to be praying alongside men anytime soon in the local mosque, but that um, they were looking for opportunities to study together and to pray together informally. So um, now, in terms of political socialization, Robert Putnam talks about um, how the most social capital is produced at 11 o'clock on Sunday, because um, after church, lots of uh, um, networking and information and relationships are formed. Um, and I think that there's social capital and political capital, or political socialization being um, uh, produced in religious communities. And partly that depends upon um, the religious architecture. So think of the Irish Catholics who are being incorporated into a very powerful, well-established, uh, politically savvy organization who are often being preached to by a native-born priest or an, an Irish priest um, who's been living in the area for a long time. So they're getting like a first-class education in the local politics. So things like learning about um, signing, uh, voucher, uh, signing a uh, petition for school vouchers or going to a candidate's night at church was something that, that many of these people brought up as experiences that they hadn't had at home. The Brazilian experience is kind of intermediary experience. So some of these people join multi-ethnic churches, where sometimes they're praying alongside other Brazilians, sometimes they're praying alongside other Latinos, sometimes they're praying alongside native-born Americans. And so the, 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 the tenor of their uh, political socialization at church varies by that contact. On the other hand, there are lots of Brazilians who belong to standalone evangelical churches that are very disconnected from the communities in which they live. And so one example is Cristina, a 45-year-old from Valadares, who talked about what, what happened to her church and, and how they didn't even know that the, the building was going to be taken away from them that, um, because it was going to be torn down. But one Sunday, Sister Flor came in and she told us what was happening. We had no idea what to do, what our rights were, who we should talk to at the town hall. Luckily, someone worked with another person from Brazil who had been in Framingham for a long time. He came by and talked to our pastor about what our options are. He helped us deal with the landlord and to find another home for our church. So the political socialization really varies. And then what, once people decide who they are, how they identify, and what they believe in, and what they want to do about it, how do they put those political skills into action? Once they get those political skills um, that are in part um, uh, inculcated through attending religious um, congregations, what do they want to do about it? And what did people say about what was a good society and what was their responsibility to, to, um, to make that good society? Well, people came with very different, what Adrian Favel calls philosophies of, of, um, of integration. So that's the idea that there are national uh, philosophies that, that, have, that are sort of underlying assumptions about how much the outsider can become like us. So the people in, that I spoke with for this study had very different relations, of, of different expectations about us and them and about how newcomers and minorities should deal with each other. So in, their homelands weren't founded by immigrants. Um, their national story wasn't one about incorporating newcomers. And it wasn't about living somewhere where there was no official state church. And so they hadn't necessarily been brought up with the idea that cultural mixing is inevitable or necessarily a good thing. So, and sometimes their personal philosophies of integration reflected that kind of experience. They also really deeply distrusted politics. So um, when I talked about, do you want to get invo involved with politics? And do you want to um, uh, be politically active? Is it worth your time? They would say things like, um, 
politics, politicians are useless, inefficient, rotten to the core, and, and they didn't trust their governments. And if states couldn't provide basic services like health and education, how could they run fair elections? And why, did, why were they paying so much attention to them now when they hadn't paid attention to them before? So given this background, we might expect that people would be coming who, want, who have very different ideas about what it means to be part of a good society and what their responsibility is to, to um, do that. But in general, when I asked what a good society is, most people said things like feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, neighbors taking care of each other, institutions that work, freedom of religion and, and speech are guaranteed, and people obey the law, and the law protects them back. When you go to the hospital, you get cured. It's not a society where everyone is equal, however. So there were, there, most people were comfortable with the idea that racial and class differences are inevitable, and certain people are natural achievers, and that societies need all kinds, be they doctors or um, or garbage collectors. And religion has a role to play in bringing good societies about. So if you don't have religion, how do you have a moral compass? And if there's not an ethical baseline in the world, how do you fight against the kind of selfishness and greed that kind of pervades um, nat natural so national society? So religious differences are an inevitable part of society. And, but most people felt that most people don't think that there's an absolute truth, and they're willing to discuss things, and that they, need, they know that they need to treat people with respect. So, and that you need to distinguish between leaders and followers, because um, it's often the leaders who get involved with politics, and the followers who keep the true sense of the faith. So there was a small group of exclusive religious global citizens who feel that they do have a lock on the truth and that it's their responsibility to um, convince the rest of us of that truth. But most of the other people, that, the vast majority of the other people that I talk with want to change the world in confessionals and in ballot boxes. And there are hot button issues like gay rights and abortion. But they're much more concerned about things like education and housing and jobs. And they're, all along the political spectrum. So in other words, there are very liberal um, people who want to use religion for liberal progressive causes. There are um, very conservative people who want to uh, fight for more conservative positions. And, and so there are potential partners in these, among these newcomers for all sides of the, of, the, of the spectrum in many of the political debates that we're talking about. Now, why don't we hear this kind of, when we, when we hear about, let me see here, okay. When we, sorry about that, I'm ahead of myself, whoop. Okay, there we go. So why don't this debates about religion and immigration reflect this reality? Well, I think there, we need to make three conceptual shifts. The first is to learn how to think outside the nation state box. So most people take for granted that the world is and always will be organized around nation states. But that's a view that's very short on history. Because when you think about it, um, capitalism and imperialism and pirating networks and anti-slavery campaigns have always been organized across borders. In the early 1900s, there were barely 130 sovereign states. And the remaining 65% of the world's political entities were colonies and protectorates. And three quarters of the more than 200 countries that are recognized today just came into existence in the last century. So assuming that social life automatically and logically takes place within national containers really blinds us to the way the world actually works. So when you take literally the label made in the USA, it means that you're forgetting that you know, part of that material was probably made in the Dominican Republic or in Bangladesh. And Eberhard Sandschneider, who's the research director at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, got it right when he told the, the 2005 delegates at the Davos conference that what we're increasingly seeing is a multidimensional system in which states and state-based multilateral organizations work with businesses and civil society through a dense web of international and interdisciplinary networks. Bush administration officials who told the 9-11 Commission that what had happened was completely beyond their imagination because they couldn't 
imagine a terrorist network that was organized across borders, nor did they have the, the, the resources to respond to one, um, got it dangerously wrong. But to pick up on these kinds of dynamics, you have to be willing to trade in your national lens for, your, for a transnational lens, or at least to use both of them at the same time. So I'm not arguing that nation states are disappearing or that they, don't, they aren't salient in political and social life. What I am arguing is that when we ask questions like this, we need to take, back, we need to take a step back and, and use a broader lens to ask, what is the appropriate spatial unit of analysis for what we're interested in, in understanding? And sometimes we'll find out that it really is a lot about what's going on with inside national borders. But sometimes we'll find out that if we don't understand the connections, how that's connected to other forces around the world, then, um, then we're missing half of the story. So what do we learn about migration when we, um, I keep doing this, I'm sorry. Okay, so how do, we re how do we understand migration when we use a transnational lens? Well, the first thing is that migration is much, as much about people who stay behind as it is about people who move. So um, just from the, the slides that I showed you at the beginning, I think you can see how people who hardly ever have traveled outside their village, let alone Santo Domingo, are now living in this space that's permeated by goods and ideas and people and objects from far away, and that the institutions that they begin to participate in also take on a transnational slant because of the, the lives, the cross-border lives of their constituencies. Um, and these landscapes are not only multi-sided, they're multi-layered. And by that I mean it's not enough to just look at what's going on between that Brazilian church in Valadares and the, the, the sister church in, in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, but how those two churches are, are nested within denominational hierarchies in both places and how those kinds of hierarchies connect. So in other words, how that sending church is part of its denomination back in Brazil and how the receiving church is part of its denomination in the United States and what kinds of connections, if any, end up um, uniting those two. Uh, those, those, those two spaces. And the third thing is that we need to move away from this idea of immigration as a, a, a linear, progressive, irreversible journey from one membership card to another and think instead of immigration as a, a kind of gauge that pivots back and forth between a sending country orientation, a receiving country orientation, and an orientation towards many of the other salient places where co-religionists or co-nationals live. So it's not just about Brazil and the United States. It's also about Brazilians who are living in Germany or Spain or in South Africa and how that kind of web spreads all over the world. Okay. And then finally, how do we need to rethink the religious landscape? Well, the the the... Religious landscape in the United States is still primarily Christian. New immigrants are small, but their cultural impact is great. And I think what they're doing is introducing new faiths, um, Latinoizing and, and Asianizing well-established denominations. And the immigrants are not the only source of the globalization of religion in the United States. So other immigrants belong to religious global movements, and they just happen to be living in the United States. And there is also what John Bowen talks about as a kind of religious public sphere where scholars and, and leaders meet either virtually or um, actually at conferences or at, um, at seminars and, or over the internet and try to work out what would be a universal Islam or what would be a universal Hinduism. So the globalization of the sacred is occurring on many fronts. And some of the changes that are precipitated by migration run parallel to these other changes. But it's not just the cast of characters that's changing. It's ideas about what religion is and where to find it. So I think we have this idea of the separation of church and state in the United States as so firmly ingrained in our psyche that we tend to um, not recognize that for some people, religion and culture are much more overlapping than we would let on. So 
when I ask people, what's Irish about you, or what's Catholic about you, or what's Muslim about you, and what's Pakistani about you, it was often very difficult for them to separate out the two because the way people live and the places that they come from, these things are very coterminous. They really overlap. And, um, there's a, there are, and, and faith guides the way people live their everyday lives, how, who they associate with, and what kinds of communities they want to belong to, even among people who say that they're not very religious. And their ideas about tolerance and diversity are shaped by experiences where states are actively religious and where expectations about us and them are quite different than in the United States. So people bring a much broader understanding of what religion is and where to find it to the table. And the sacred and the spiritual really spill over into the neighborhood and the workplace and the, the schoolyard. So when people put a, a cross-stitched saying, a, a sacred saying on their refrigerator or they hang a, um, a, a picture of their guru on their dashboard, um, they, they're doing a religious act as well as a cultural act. Or when a Latino family is celebrating a quinceanera, that is a religious act and a cultural act. Or when a Hindu son asks his elderly parents to live with him, he's doing that because that's what a good Hindu does and that's what a good Indian does. And so for some of these people, American values are in part religious values and they're not just made in the United States but around the, the world. Now people also bring a very different understanding about what it means to belong to a religious community. So for some people it does mean going to a building where you pay dues, where there's a leader and a formal structure. But many people, their, their religiosity is not um, predicated on praying with the same group of people, praying collectively, and if it is praying collectively, praying with the same group of people on a regular basis. So we learn a lot more about um, what, what, how religion is changing by looking at the informal manifestations outside of formal buildings than we do sometimes at what's looking at, at what's going on inside a church or a temple. And just as the boundaries of, of religious buildings are permeable, so are the boundaries of religious traditions. So we tend to think that somebody's either Catholic or, or Protestant or Hindu or Buddhist. And many of the people I spoke with were very comfortable combining elements from different faiths. And this had always been happening. So um, much of Latino Catholicism or Brazilian Catholicism, for example, has always combined elements from um, Africa and from indigenous practices and from formal Christianity. So for these individuals, boundary crossing or combining elements from different faiths is the rule, not the exception. And, and religion kind of gives you a permission slip for doing that. And the American context, with its very wide array of religious choices, really strongly encouraging, encourages this kind of, of religious mixing and matching. So, I think about religion as a kind of archetypical spatial and temporal boundary crosser because it gives people symbols and rituals and narratives that allow themselves to imagine themselves in um, these kinds of sacred landscapes that are marked by holy sites and shrines and places of worship. And so for some people, the, the, for some Swadhyayis, which is another Hindu group that I studied, it's more important the, the boundaries of that landscape are um, Bombay and Fiji and London and, and, and Chicago and uh, South Africa because that's where other Swadhyayis live. And it's, it's you know, temples and holy places and minarets or shrines that make up the boundaries of that, that landscape. Um, and this is also a, religion also enables us to transcend the boundaries of time. So this is how, what, what, um, Thomas Tweed was writing about when he talked about Cubans bringing their newborns to be um, baptized into the patron saint shrine that the community had built in Miami. So they were baptizing them into a Cuba in the past that existed on the island, a Cuba that now existed in Miami, and a Cuba in the future that they hoped would once again be, be in, in, in Cuba. So what's the, the bottom line of all of this? Let me see if I can get this right. Good. Okay. So I think a lot of people listen to this uh, scenario and say, you know, how can you, how can you be loyal to two countries at the same time? How can you live lives that cross borders? It's a very threatening thing, and that's some of the fear that Samuel Huntington, for example, was was tapping into in his in his last book. 
but I think we need to see immigrants as the translators and bridge builders and religious diplomats that the world really desperately needs because they are way ahead of the rest of us in terms of letting go of these false dichotomies between here and there and us and them and either and or and sort of modeling a way to be in a global world and also translating that for the rest of us. I also think we need to learn how to think outside the Christian box. So there's this um, real tendency to conflate religion with what I often say is Bibles, buildings, and boys. The idea that religion is, you know, there's always a book that everyone believes in, that you go to a particular building to worship it, and that there's a, a leader, usually a boy, standing in the front of the room. That's not the experience that many newcomers are bringing. It's not the experience of many native-born Americans as well. And, um, and, and if we're concerned about religious pluralism, we need to learn how to think outside the Christian box. And that there is a role for religion in progressive politics. And I know, um, uh, I think that the religious right has controlled the religious airwaves for a long time. That seems to be changing. But there are many, many people who are, um, you know, that, and there's a lot of people who can give you tons of examples of how religion has um, been the source of many, many uh, sore spots in history. I'm not debating that. But I also think we forget that Religion was important in the anti-slavery movement, in the civil rights movement, in uh, the, the immigrant rights movement of today, and that we need to make room for a whole host of religious voices that can be all along the political spectrum. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Well, I guess I, I want to, um, it's hard to answer that question because it's a big question. And I also want to really drive home what, to broaden the scale of what falls under that umbrella of religiosity. So even the people who say they're not religious are engaging in practices that it's hard to sort out what is religious and what's not. You know, what, is that religious, is that cultural? So that, I really want to emphasize that kind of conflation. Um, but let me think about how I can answer that question. I mean, it, it sort of uh, depends upon the architectures that it, or the networks that it embeds you in, right? So people who are part of these very strong, um, tightly uh, constituted networks are, their global gaze is very much constrained by the, um, kind of, I'm thinking of a, um, a roller coaster and the way the sides come up. You know, the so, so what you can see and what you can't see is predicated by that, right? So if people are in very strict communities with very tight uh, channels, they are globally connected very much to their um, other co-religionists and, you know, would be mo more likely to think about themselves as religious global citizens as opposed to people who you know, are more on the self-help uh, religiosity side of the spectrum or the um, you know, questioning faithful, what was one of the categories that I talked about where you know, uh, in, within that category there was a spectrum of people who you know, were m more on the more strict and then who also felt like they could mix and match and make it up and sort of, and that would put them in touch with a whole bunch of different kinds of people, make them think that they should put their religious beliefs into practice in a different way. So, um, you know, I guess another answer to that question is that I see, you know, Hindu communities getting, taking on these kind of corporate forms in the same way that 
that um, Protestant and, and the Catholic community has. And so I think we're kind of seeing that around the world. And then the, so the dividing line will be between the, the, the strictness and the tightness of that architecture as opposed to the flexibility and unsystematicness of that architecture. I'm sorry? Different motives behind the analysis. Uh -huh. um, the reason why I ask is because I think hybrids and communities who migrate voluntarily would have a different time to own that place and sort of feel forced to leave that place. Absolutely. I'm thinking of uh, refugees. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I, I was asked to actually repeat the questions just so that they'll get on the videotape. So I am going to repeat an abbreviated version of your question, which is, what is the difference between people who left their countries voluntarily and those who were forced to leave as refugees because of political circumstances? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, some, pe some people who are forced to leave want nothing to do with the homeland. Some want very much to change what's going on in the homeland. But in fact, I, I had a hard time finding a Muslim community to study. And I started out um, looking at the Lebanese community, because that's an old community in Boston, and I thought it would be really interesting to do it historically, like I could do some historical analysis with the Irish community. And that was a community that most, many of those people had left during the Lebanese Civil War, and they didn't want anything to do with Lebanon. So there wasn't a lot of there there. Um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. Veronica. Thank you for the period. <coughs> I remember when you were barely planning out the study. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, so take, for example, um, the Irish community. So in Ireland, um, it's hard for me to not speak in broad generalization, so forgive me for that. If I had to say two things that people would say about how they felt about the church, Besides feeling a sort of some level of comfort with it because it's so much a part of daily life, it's the oppressor or the kind of um, uh, you know just rote kind of thing. You go to church um, every week. It's over in an hour, and then you're out of there. And then and so people do not think about. Um, learn, you know, think about the church as a place for politics. In fact, it's a negative political force for some people. And they don't think about the church as a place to get information about jobs or networks or anything like that. Then, you know, looking for a community in Boston, having a progressive young Irish-born priest come and reach out, people start coming to church, and then they're hearing about politics, but they're hearing about a certain kind of politics, right? They're hearing about Boston Irish pol local politics. So, and they're also hearing about, the, they're, they're also part of a sophisticated enough network that's building a, a kind of immigrant rights political action committee, both within the United States, but also to try to keep Irish emigrants on the radar screen of the Irish public back home. And so the Irish government puts money into that, and the Irish church puts money into that. 
And so that's a pretty unique kind of thing. Take Brazilians who are anti-politics, who don't, you know, it, it, I, I think that if anything, they're, they're much more wanting to be involved in, in um, U.S. politics and local politics in Framingham than they want anything to do with Brazil. And they're, when, when their religious leaders, if and when their religious leaders are telling them about being involved in, in the broader community, it's normally within a kind of charitable frame, like a social, I wouldn't say social justice because that sounds too progressive, but a, a sort of you know, helping charitable frame. So you know, are those, is that politic? I, I mean, I think about politics as a, as a small p. But those are just two kinds of examples of how the, the architecture, the network, the nature of the leadership, the experience from the homeland gets transferred onto the experience in the United States. That kind of makes that play out differently. Yes. Um, and, and what? How do how do we kind of approach that question also on this level? I think that's a really good question, and definitely sounds like I'm. Am I still on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's a major shift to go from being a rule maker to a rule taker. So, and that that um, transition takes more than a generation. So there's a sort of confidence that you bring with you about your encounters with the other uh, that you have from being a majority in your country of origin that I don't think is going to last um, beyond the first generation. So in other words, now I've been doing some work on the children of, of Gujarati Muslim and Hindus. And there you have a, um, I, was, I have been very struck at how, how open the parents were, the parent generation was, to incorporating Christian symbols into their lives. That they weren't bothered by things like um, having a Christmas tree on, a, um, on public property, you know, in the, on the public school property or at the post office. Or they wanted to have Christmas trees in their homes because that's a way to be American and they don't want their children to be left out. But I think that comes with a kind of confidence of having been the majority before so that you can't imagine what it might do to your faith to be, to be in this overwhelmingly Christian dominant frame. And so um, I think we need to study that across generations and, um, and also, you know, that what work, what, what do you get from being religious? Or what do you get from being religious in a particular way of expressing your um, religiosity in a Christian enough form that you can be part, that it allows you to be part of America? Because I think we, you know, I always go back to um, Jose Casanova's uh, story or um, I don't know whether it was a story or a study, but his saying that the same Italians who left um, Italy and went to Argentina became anarchists, and, and the ones who came to the United States became ardent Catholics. Well, what's that about? That's about the American context allowing you to be diff wanting you to be religious, and also wanting you, allowing you to be different and religious in a much more easy way than to be different and different by race or different by ethnicity. So it's what the, what the context demands of you and what work that religiosity can do for you as well that shapes the experience. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, in the back. Say 
say again, please? Sorry. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> I think I heard you. <laughs> um, that's not something that I set out to study, but I bumped into it. You know, so the you know the old time space compression idea is definitely happening here because people can go. You know, people were watching Brazilians were watching mass on Brazilian TV, the mass that had been videotaped in Somerville, Massachusetts. So they could pray along with their relatives. They could also see their relatives. Okay, so the technology definitely enables this. And then in terms of the, um, you know, some of these faiths are mediated to begin with. So the way that Swadhi Ayes practice, their, their collective practice, if there is one, is to get together and listen to a pravachana speech by their former guru and now his successor, who is his uh, niece. And those are videotaped and then, um, you know, sent around. They, there's a big office in Bombay and those are sent, they used to be sent around India and on a, you know, the main practice takes place on a, on a Sunday, but um, on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night in a given neighborhood, there'd be people meeting in a garage and watching this together. Well, now those get sent all over the world and they're also dubbed in English for the second generation. So this is, you know, it's big business, but it's also, um, you know, um, an, an established way of practice because they were, what I wanted to say also was they were using media to begin with. So in a Swami Narayan context, they're used to having these meetings of like 10,000 people in a gigantic hall and yes, you can see you can sit in the back and see the 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 sadhu, but he's also broadcast on these big screens, and so you kind of feel like you're interacting with him, like you have a personal relationship with him. So that came some of that came from there already. That was a way to you know spread the word already, and then it's just being um, used to 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 spread that that franchise in a lot of ways. Started making inroads with like you know evangelicals, but that lost in the last election. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't the religious right been able to make inroads to these religious communities, migrants, uh, almost at all? There's probably no movement. What do you think that might be, or what might be happening that, that they're not making the connection, especially since they are considered more conservative, more traditional? Wow, I I I don't have data at my fingertips. So I'd like to hear yours because I kind of feel like they have made inroads with they some have, of those communities. They have, they have. Yeah. I've noticed on individual issues, especially in California, they've been able to get voting mm -hmm. gay rights on abortion. Yeah. Yeah. However, when it comes to voting for political candidates, um, candidates mm -hmm. they tend to vote for progressive Democrats, mm -hmm. a lot of um, immigrant groups. I'm thinking, I don't know, this is just a theory I'm developing, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to get more information. Mm -hmm. Party is so tied to the notion that the state is supposed to be independent of social welfare, is supposed to be independent of a lot of things, and 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 especially looking at some right wing activists within the party who says we have to give up on these migrants; they're just not going to vote for us. Yeah. There's just no way in heck because they don't share the same values. And when they say values, they're not talking about moral values; they're talking about the role of the state. And in the end, the role of the state, you know, very uh, maybe libertarian or, or whatnot. I just cannot find any of that impulse among almost any even conservative religious folks. Mm -hmm. Even conservative evangelical Latinos or conservative Protestants in the black community or in the migrants, they just don't share that view that the state is supposed to be mm -hmm. that separate when it comes to those things. Right. And that's why the message, but I have no number. It's just yeah. a hunch that I'm having. Yeah. Well, it make, your question makes me think that we have to sort of unpack that question and think about inroads in what way. So 
inroads on particular issues versus inroads for particular candidates versus, so because it might not be the same direction. And then also, you know, for not for not necessarily for Pakistanis or for you know wealthier, more professional migrants, but certainly just the overwhelming perception that the Republican Party is anti-immigrant is going to uh, got to be a major turnoff. You know. <laughs> I have a question. Um, have you, are you familiar with Robert Wolfenow's new book, uh, Boundless State? No. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've read chapters it, of it, but not the. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I skimmed it myself as well. Um, in it, I think he, he just sort of makes this general argument that. Um, American evangelicals are a lot more, you know, engaged in practices that are a lot more transnational than you know, most people would assume. Mm -hmm. and just by like, you know, what what we're, the images we're presented with of the religious right on the you know, television and the media, mm -hmm. um, they actually engage in a lot of missionary work internationally. Yeah. And it's a big part of their faith spreading, um, you know, spreading the faith to other people and um, you know, trying to tackle like poverty and poverty and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I was curious, because uh, you know you brought it up, you talked about this one case of um, this Brazilian uh, evangelical, I think you said, it was an evangelical immigrant who said that um, they migrated twice, once to come to this country, another yeah. time, you know, um, you know, to be more in touch with the faith and remove themselves from like, the secular world. Um, I was I was curious what, what sorts of patterns you saw um, among immigrants in your sample of. Uh, of engaging in, in sort of transnational practices because, um, you know, as, as you point out, um, immigrants are like religious diplomats, uh, you know, that they did in school. So you're, you're talking about specifically missionizing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what sorts of things did you see come up in the Well, that's another pattern that I see across faiths, that there's a kind of missionizing branch so, uh, that gets mediated, <laughs> to, go back the, to go back to that question. Um, and so, First of all, there's reverse missionary activity going on. So in the evangelical, sorry, I've got a cold. In the evangelical um, Brazilian community, some of those people are coming, some of the pastors who brought those faith, those faith traditions to the United States are the, are the um, beneficiaries of mission and movements that went down to Brazil in you know the early 1900s and so and throughout the 1900s and so say for example the Four Square Church which I which was started here in California did not take is not did not take a big hold went down to Brazil and is quite prominent in Brazil and now is coming up to the northeast of the United States because there are Brazilians there and it doesn't matter you know there and that many of these pastors feel like it's their responsibility to re-evangelize the United States and to sort of get us back on track. So um, what I see in the, the Indian community, Swathi, um, in, in, in that particular community, they have this tradition of spreading, they, it, it, it's called Bhakti Ferry. And basically, the founder of this uh, group had this idea of um, Go, you know, carrying the word, but sort of, it's a cross caste experience. So middle class people, urban people, would go to rural areas and just go over, you know, a period of several months to a village. Wouldn't take any food, wouldn't take any water because they didn't want there to be any kind of reciprocal dependence there, and just kind of talk. And after a while. It would come out about Dadaji's preachings, and the village, somebody would convert, and then the village would convert. Now, this is something that you can do when you're in India. You have time. You can take the weekend. Maybe you're more flexible or something like that. How to do Bhakti Ferry in the United States? Well, you, you know, you're in Massachusetts. You're in New Jersey. You want to spread Dadaji's word. You know there are Gujaratis living in Massachusetts. You look in the telephone book for Gujarati last names, and you drive up to Lowell, Massachusetts, and show up at people's doors. 
And because there is a tradition of hospitality, nobody's going to shut the door in your face and not offer you a cup of tea. And then you show up the second, you know, two weeks later, two weeks later, and then there's a community planted again. And then that community starts doing the same thing in Fiji, in Trinidad, organizing these kinds of trips. So that's a, um, you know, a very interesting example of how this practice has been adopted. So they don't go every two weeks, and they don't spend a week there, and it's not necessarily a cross-caste experience, but it is Bhakti Ferry adopted to this you know, differing context and a way to continue it. So. does is present a very positive view of the role of religion in American public life and of um, the particular immigrants that you're talking to. But to, to a certain extent, there's a certain problem of the situation. You're interviewing people who are small minorities within a much larger nation. And so they, they do speak very sincerely about ideals of tolerance and so forth. At the same time, some of these people may be sending money to nationalist Hindu organizations like the BJP that in their homeland are in fact not particularly tolerant. So um, when you're a small minority, you always preach tolerance. When you're a majority power, you may want to purify the nation, get rid of the infidels, and, um, and be fairly brutal about it. Yeah. So there's, there's something... People have different agendas depending on their subject position within the particular nation that they are. Yeah. This is, of course, a transnational process, but I wonder if you could ad address this issue of, it builds on the majority-minority mm -hmm. question that already came up, but it, it, there's a particular political valence to how that's implemented. No, I agree. I, I mean, I, I think it depends upon who you think your conversation partner is, right? So who was I addressing this book to? To, you know, my colleagues who don't take religion seriously, to you know the, to my friends who think that religion is automatically a bad thing. Now, do I think it's always a good thing? You know, do I not know that that you know some NRIs are sending money back to neo Hindu Hindu movements? Of course I do, but I, it's almost like you know I I don't think the scale was on the, that. I think the, the the, the, the tenor of the conversation was so much to the negative that my, my impetus was to try to send it back over to the positive. Now, not to say by any means that this is always good or that everyone is. I tried to be very careful about saying there are conversation partners on all sides of the political spectrum. And there are people who I met who really do feel like they have a lock on the truth and they're admissionizing to convince the rest of us. And there, there's no negotiation, there's no change in the rules. And, you know, but not all the people, not all NRIs are supporting, you know, the BJP. So we just need a more nuanced picture of this. We need a more uh, polyvalent conversation. And that was my objective. No. Otherwise, I think we could uh, simply thank the 11th for a very good talk. Thanks very much. Um, and we appreciated uh, your response to a variety of different questions and also laying out this program, which I think, at least as I see it, is a program for America to rethink its attitude to religions, in particular what I might call unfamiliar religions, strange religions, that, that have um, perhaps not been taken very seriously. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.